But I have been super excited to start this new year. Uh, this, this last week, most of you know, I was up in Portland, and there were like four to five different times where somebody asked me uh, what we were doing as a church this year, and uh, you know whether I was excited for this next year. And before I had known it, like four or five different times, I had sort of launched into this little this little sermon uh, explaining what we were going to be up to and why it was so important, and, and why I'm so excited about what God is doing in our lives and uh, in this church. This year, uh, from a, a scriptural con uh, perspective, in terms of what we're doing together as a people, devoting our, our lives to God's word, we're going to hear and read and study and meditate on and wrestle with and attempt to live out four books of the Bible. And that statement is a little bit misleading because in your Bibles, they actually show up as six books. But that's because two of the four books uh, were so long that they had to be split between two scrolls before Bibles were books. These four books are Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. And so actually what I'd like for you to do is take your Bible and turn to the table of contents. Right now you're thinking... Where's that? <laughs> Where's that? I thought this was supposed to be exciting. <laughs> cool, tables of contents. Just wait. So, should be there, first page. It's a pretty easy flip. Uh, so if you look at this list, two years ago, we spent the year going through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The first five books of the Bible. Notice that Joshua is listed right after Deuteronomy. And so for us, after a year in Matthew, Isaiah, Mark, and Acts, we're picking up the story of Israel back where we left off a year ago. You can see where Samuel and Kings are divided into two books each. You see that? First and second Samuel, first and second Kings. And then you, historically, Ruth, the book of Ruth, uh, which comes right after Judges, takes place during the same period of time as the book of Judges, which gives us a little bit of a hint about how these books uh, were ordered in the, the canon or the standard of Scripture. So if you keep looking, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, together with Joshua through Kings, have been known by Christians as the historical books. Primarily because they tell Israel's history. From the time they arrived uh, at the land that God had promised to give them, all the way to when uh, they are exiled from that land and go to places like Assyria and Babylon, and then finally concluding with Israel's return to the land. This is Israel's history. Some people hear the word history, and they immediately tune out. I think, boring. I've sat in history classes before. That stuff's terrible. Others hear history and they immediately get excited and think, this is right up my alley, right? They love facts, dates, and names, and places. They are trivia experts who you hate playing Trivial Pursuit with. And they're able to rattle off biblical dates and details the way sports fanatics can rattle off batting averages and obscure advanced statistics. And then others hear history and, and being lovers of historical fiction. They sit back and they enjoy the ride, appreciating a good story. They find the individual dramas of Rahab and Gideon, David and Bathsheba, to be captivating. These become the stories then that we tell and retell. And it's true, right? There are stretches of Israel's history that can feel especially boring. Especially without a sense of the story being told, it's easy to get lost among strange people in strange places who do strange things. And it's also true that these books are filled with facts and figures, names and dates, the stuff of every trivia buff's dreams. It's also true that these books tell a lot of fun and interesting and compelling and exciting and mysterious stories. 
So if these are your expectations, I want to provide you with a different way of expecting from these four books this year. I want to help you be excited for our time in these books for this year in a maybe altogether different way. Because there's something about these books that to me makes all the difference in the world. And it's this, that while the Christian tradition has grouped these books historically, calling them the historical books, the Jewish tradition has another name for them entirely. So you might think back to Matthew or Mark, which we've been in this year. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Uh, In Matthew, Jesus makes a definitive claim about what he had come to do with Israel's scriptures. The Hebrew Bible that we often call the first or Old Testament. He said this, he said, I have not come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I have come to fulfill them. We we tend to hear Jesus uh, talking about prophets and we think that he's talking about the prophets that come near the end of the First Testament, the Old Testament. We think of guys like Isaiah and Jeremiah, Daniel and Malachi. And then when we think of prophecy being fulfilled, when we look for fulfilled prophecy, uh, things that, ha- that Jesus did that fulfilled what the Old Testament said were going to happen, we tend to look at these same books. We think of Amos and Micah or Ezekiel and Zechariah, the final books of the Old Testament. Except the problem with this is that ancient Jews had a different way of ordering these texts that, that we share with them. When Jesus speaks of the prophets, he's actually describing a huge collection of writings that are broken up into two main sections, the former prophets and the latter prophets. When we, th- when we think of the prophets, we usually think of the latter prophets, But in the Jewish tradition, the tradition that Jesus appeals to when he speaks this truth about Torah and the prophets, the prophets are so much more than just the latter prophets. To the Jewish people, including Jesus, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings are the former prophets. These books of history are prophetic books. They are prophetic histories. That should cause a little bit of attention in you as you think about what you tend to think of prophecy. Right? We tend to believe that prophets are people who show up and announce the future. These books of prophetic history force us to admit that maybe we have a misunderstanding of prophecy. Of the prophets, former and latter, there is only a fraction of their content that actually speaks of the future. The overwhelming bulk of the material remembers and reflects on the past in order to speak to a more faithful present. The prophets occasionally come along and and say, lift up your eyes and look to the future. But usually this is for the purpose of helping God's people live better lives now. Be more faithful in their lives in the present. As a quick example of just how disconnected the church has been from a Jewish understanding of prophecy, uh, it's worth considering the book of Daniel. This is the book maybe along with Isaiah, that the church tends to highlight as the prophetic work of the Old Testament, and yet it isn't considered one of the prophets in the Hebrew canon. It is, according to Jewish tradition, not a former prophet or not a latter prophet. It's one of the writings. So if Daniel isn't a prophet and these historical books are Uh, are prophetic in some way, then we have this exciting kind of task in front of us this year, this this exciting project to, to answer this question. What does it mean for historical accounts to be God's prophetic word to us? In a few minutes, I'll close with some thoughts on what it means for us to to read prophetic history and to to meet God in these prophetic texts. But for the next few minutes, I want to offer a quick survey of the former prophets, picking up where we'll start uh, our year here in the book of Joshua. 
So uh, just if you would flip there and just kind of hang out, we'll, we'll jump to each of the, the books. You're open to your table of contents so you know exactly where to go. So Joshua, the Hebrew name of our Lord. Translated over time into the name that we've become familiar with, Jesus. The book of Joshua takes place uh, many, many years before the Joshua who would be born to die to take away the sins of the world. But this book of Joshua tells the story of God bringing Israel, his chosen people, victoriously into the promised land, the, law, the land that he had promised to them. Joshua shows what happens when God's people follow his instructions. And it also shows that the only real enemy to God and to God giving his people all that he wants to give them is his people. <laughs> Refusing to trust, refusing to receive all that God would give to them. We get a flavor of this. You're in Joshua, turn to Joshua 21. Verse 43. This is sort of a, a gives a sense of the whole of what's happening in Joshua. Joshua 21, verse 43. Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers. And they took possession of it and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them. For the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. Joshua, as a book, as part of the former prophets, trains us to follow God wholeheartedly. To follow God with great courage into his promises. Joshua trains us to face God's enemies without fear. Joshua trains us to trust the word of God and to keep pressing forward, never settling for less than all of what God has for us. That's Joshua. Clearly simplified, because <laughs> we're going to spend the next six weeks in it, uh, digging into what that looks like and how uh, these things are played out. In a couple of months, we'll move to the book of Judges. Having settled in the promised land, Israel immediately struggles to live as God's people. The spirit of the age of the Judges is summed up in Judges with this saying, Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Judges is about the closest thing the Bible has to the television show Breaking Bad. How far can the Israelites go in rebelling against God and destroying themselves? By the end of Judges, you realize it is pretty far. So turn to Judges chapter 2. And we'll sample it. Judges 2. And I did not know the verse for myself. That's always awkward. There we go. And verse 10. Nice. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, which means that whole generation died as their fathers had. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals, and they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. 
They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. Judges trains us to take responsibility for our faith and for passing on the faith. Uh, Wendell Berry is an essay writer, a novelist, uh, and a farmer. Interesting combination of things. Uh, but he gave me a really interesting picture for thinking about the task that God's people have in passing the faith on to each generation. Uh, imagine a forest with a vibrant ecosystem of forest fully alive and a community of people who live in and near that forest who make their living on that forest. The book of Judges opens with the forest of faith being cut down completely. There is no faith in God remaining. And so Israel looks like one of those, those haunting vistas where for miles all you can see are bald, dead, lifeless stumps where a forest once existed. Which means that the people of Israel, knowing nothing of their God, began to turn to resources outside of their forest. But, what, but it's worse than that, really. Each generation can't see beyond itself. And so every generation seems to rediscover God because God continues to reveal himself to each new generation. But then failing to pass the faith on again, pass it on to the next generation, the next generation cuts the forest back down and they're back where they started, vistas of nothing but stumps. The community never gets fully grown trees from their forest, and each successive generation is left to figure it out, figure it out um, on their own. Consider then an example, uh, a native tribe from Wisconsin called the Menomini. Uh, in the late 1800s, uh, this tribe lived in a forest region, and uh, they had enough forest to produce over a billion, they call board feet, of timber to sell and to use for themselves. Several decades later, the U.S. Forest Service uh, took over management of that forest and through what you call clear cutting, just wiping out large chunks of the forest, they had removed almost 70% of it in just a couple decades. Within a generation, the Menomini were left with almost nothing. But uh, this tribe was finally able to regain stewardship of the forest. And what they did was they developed a long-term plan for restoring, preserving, and using the forest in a sustainable way. The forest since then has now more than fully recovered, providing more wood than it did in the late 1800s. And without going into all of the details of their strategy, it's important to point out that, that the key like linchpin of their, of their strategy, of their plan, uh, is that they have to keep in mind the seventh generation of Minomini. As they plan out their use of the forest, they say, how does this affect what will be available to the seventh generation? This means that each generation then has a responsibility for maintaining and stewarding this forest, but then also teaching each generation that comes two things, how to forest well, how to care for it. But the, the most important thing is why they would forest in this way. See, because young generations always think they can do better than their parents. And when young generations of men and many grow up in the United States where the economic environment is all about maximizing profits, it makes sense that young generations would struggle to understand the kind of conservative use of, of resources that the Menomini have adopted. It's only when they learn to think generationally that this new generation are capable of using the land and their resources in ways that 
that meet their needs in the present and also honor and bless future generations. With all of that in mind, come back to Judges with me. Judges shows us what self-interest and short-sightedness gets for God's people. The book of Judges pleads with us to look past our own self-interest. Judges begs us to look past ourselves and our immediate heirs. Judges calls us to know the Lord, to know the work that he has done, and Judges urges us to make that Lord known to those who come after us. The book of Judges is then followed by Samuel. The book of Samuel, the two books of Samuel. Your Bible splits it into two, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, but Samuel is really just one long sweeping epic. For the most part, people who are completely unfamiliar with the First Testament are at least familiar with stories from Samuel. Samuel is the tale of Israel's first two kings. With, with incredible success, they build the kingdom of Israel. But as we heard Alex read from Samuel earlier, we can't help but hear in these stories of these conquering kings a question mark lingering in our heads. Should the Israelites have a king at all? So turn over to 1 Samuel. Right after Ruth. chapter 8. And we'll just rehear a bit of what Alex read for us, just a little bit of it, starting with verse 4. <coughs> According to all the deeds that, that they have done, from the day, that's verse 8, verse 4, that all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them uh, up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Samuel trains us in matters of power and of leadership. The Israelites still living during the time of the judges when Samuel opens up, they only know how to seek God. They only know how to serve God when they have a leader who stands in front of them and says, you should seek God and you should serve God. They don't have the ability to seek God and serve God on their own, by their own conviction, by their own desire. And so whether it's a judge or a priest or a prophet or a general, the people do not want to take responsibility for their own faithfulness. They want somebody else to lead them. They demand that somebody else lead them. They want someone else to be responsible for them. They want somebody else to take the blame when they fail to be faithful. And so they look around to the nations that surround them and they see these mighty kings and they see the stability that kings seem to bring to a people and they covet what their neighbors have. But the, book of Judges has, but the book of Judges right before Samuel already taught us that the eyes of the Israelites are not to be trusted. This is why they are to obey God's instructions. God's word is supposed to retrain their eyes. They are to learn to see the world as God sees. But instead, like in Judges, they can only see their own interests. They can only see their own generation. And so when Samuel tells the Israelites what will happen to future generations if they are given a king, they remain, they remain unshaken in their desire for one. 
almost as if they're saying, hey, they, that's their problem. Kick that down the road a little bit for them to worry about. Reading through Israel's history, I mean, there are so many kings that, that are talked about and that we hear about that we can lose this point. Israel has a king, not because that is how it was supposed to be, but because God gives his people over to the desires of their hearts. And so we're trained to look at our lives and to say, what are the blessings that I assumed were from God because he wanted me to have them versus what are the things I have because I demanded them of God and he gave me over to the desires of their heart, the desire of my heart. Samuel trains us to see the destructive power of king making for a community. And this is important for us as ever. We don't like to call our leaders kings, but kings are what we are in the business of making as a people. The church in America is obsessed with our national leaders. We call them presidents. You could call them, a king, call them kings. The church in America is obsessed with mighty CEOs who are masters of organizational leadership and who expand their economic territory like the kings of old. Because like Israel, we hungry to see a warrior king expand Israel's borders further and further. The church is today obsessed with the kinds of charismatic leaders who can grow congregations into thriving kingdoms. The virtues that Israel loved in this kind of leadership, and we see it as the story plays out, virtues of efficiency and effectiveness and uh, industrialism and militarism. Th these are the very things that come to oppress the people who, who cry out for a king. And these are the very qualities that we have grown to love and yearn for in our leaders. Samuel trains us to yearn for something else, something better. Shepherds who serve the one king. We'll finally finish the year with the history that sees Israel fall apart. Kings picks up the story of Israel's greatest king and tells the story of that king's sons dividing the nation. And those who have been named as God's people essentially asking God, to send them away into exile, away from God's presence. The kings that rule over the northern and the southern kingdoms of Israel become exactly what Samuel predicted. This is why these stories have to be read together, Sam, uh, Samuel and Kings, because what's happening in Kings is what God spoke through Samuel would happen many years earlier. And with every king, we're given an evaluation. And if you've read Kings, you're familiar with this sort of chant because it, it comes a lot. And so and so king walked in the ways of God, doing what was good in the eyes of the Lord. Well, that one doesn't happen quite as much as this one. And so and so king did what was wicked in the eyes of the Lord, walking in the ways of his father. These become the two ways that, that the book of Kings evaluates leader after leader after leader so that ultimately this tedious listing of Israel's kings trains us to evaluate our own leaders, spiritual, secular, wherever we find them, based on God's word, based on God's intentions for his people, based on God's justice and God's righteousness. Has a leader been faithful or has a leader been unfaithful. These are the categories that, that Kings teaches us, trains us to, to work in. Kings makes the case that we must learn to recognize faithfulness. And we must learn to recognize unfaithfulness in our leaders. This is a critical lesson for us, especially in an election year. We tend to evaluate our leaders, not based on faithfulness or unfaithfulness, but based whether or not we like them or not, based on what they've done for us or not. 
Kings teaches us to praise the leaders who demand that we give up our idols. Sadly, these are the leaders that we often run out of town. Kings teaches us that the most successful leaders are often the least faithful. Kings teaches us that, that we shouldn't put much trust in our leaders to make us a more faithful people. As much practical material as these books have in thinking about issues of power and leadership in a community, their most important feature actually is all about where they come from. These books, our Jewish brothers and sisters, our Christian brothers and sisters through the centuries have declared, whether they call them the prophets or history, these books are a gift. They're a gift to you, to us, from God. Do you want to know God? Do you want to know who he is? Do you want to know how God interacts with humanity in their best moments and in their worst moments? Read these. God invites. There are several places in these books, these four books, where we realize that, that other sources have been used. Uh, the, the authors of these books just name them outright. Uh, books of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah, books of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel, books of the victories of, of Yahweh's army. Uh, turns out that for Israel, there were other history books available to them. And some of them detailed the wars they fought, and some of them detailed and highlighted their kings, and others detailed other things, some of their religious practices. But when Jesus spoke of these books, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, as the prophets, he was making an important claim. He was emphasizing something the Jewish people had already believed, that all history, all history books, if they are any good, are trying to convince you that their uh, understanding of history is the best understanding of history. And what Jesus says is that this understanding of Israel's history is the very best understanding of their history. That, that in these texts, we might actually hear an authoritative and accurate rendering of who God is and what God has done for these people. See, at, at the time when Israel was sent into exile, this is really important because there were those who believed that Israel was being sent into exile because God was done with them forever, because God had abandoned them forever. But you can't come to that conclusion reading these books. And there were Gentiles, Gentiles who lived among the Israelites and Gentiles who lived in the places where the Israelites were, were abandoned or exiled to, who said, you know why you're here, right? And they go, no. And they said, because your God doesn't exist. Because your God is too weak to keep you in your land. Because your God is, and you can fill in the blank. And so Gentiles were eager to tell the Israelites who their God was. This history, Joshua through Kings, interprets Israel's history in an altogether different way. Israel isn't abandoned because they're sent into exile. They are getting what they asked for all along. God has been patient with them, showing them that the desires of their hearts are destructive, but they remain committed to those destructive ways. Stubborn. We might resonate with that. Israel's history introduces us to a God who meets these people in particular times and places and often attempts to accommodate them. Meaning, meeting them right where they're at, giving them the desires of their hearts, which means we have a challenging task as we read this book, these books. We have to make sure we are clear about whether God is giving the Israelites something because he intended to give them something or because he's giving them over to something, something destructive, something they desire. This ability to discern is what the church is called to today. Do we have what we have because God has given it to us, because of our faithfulness, because of God's faithfulness, or do we have what we have 
because we have grasped for it. We have sought it, and God has allowed us to have it, even if it's not the best for us. This history that we are, are reading, that we're wrestling with, that we're studying, claims to be a definitive interpretation of how God has interacted with his chosen people. It's as though God says, this is how you should read Israel's history. This is a fun task. When I say I'm excited about this, I, I really am. Because there's something really interesting about this history. And that is, if you were to ask somebody to tell you about their life, tell you about how they came to get where they're at, we have a natural tendency to highlight certain events that make us out to be the heroes of our own story. Right? Maybe we're the hero. Maybe we're the tragic victim. Whatever place we find in our stories, we tell a particular story highlighting certain events that get us to that point. But either we are the, the one who's been successful all the way along or we're the one who's been oppressed all the way along. It's not often that you get somebody telling a history like this. I love this. These books are unashamed that God is the true God of creation, that God has, is good and that he is more powerful than any rival that would, would claim to be better or bigger than him. That there, it is unashamed in those, in those confessions. But what's really interesting is how uh, self-deprecating these books are about the Israelites. And it wouldn't be surprising to us if somebody else living outside of Israel who hated the Israelites were like, I'm going to write an awesome history about them. They're terrible. God hates them. That's why you're not in the land, right? But that's not what we have. We have the Israelites looking back at their past and going, dang it. We messed up a lot. Wow. God is so stinking faithful. He had no reason to stick with us. In fact, by the terms of the agreement we made with God at Sinai and then confirmed again and again, we have broken the relationship. We've broken the covenant and God, for whatever bizarre re reason, says, I, I have not allowed it to be broken. I will maintain it. I will seek you and I will chase you and I will love you and you will be my people, and I will be your God. To what degree are we willing to learn from these histories as we look at our lives, as we look at our individual lives, as we look at the lives of our households, as we look at uh, our congregation, as we look at our nation, as we look at the world, to speak truthfully, to allow God to interpret the events of our world and our lives in ways that help us be faithful to him today and in the days that come. Part of why we come to the table every week and we take the bread and we take the cup is to remember that in whatever ways we hope to interpret the world, in whatever ways we, we, we intend to make sense of what's going on in the world, to whatever extent we think events like 9-11 or other events are the most important events uh, in history, every time we come to the table, we come together as a people called by God to say no. The most important event in history was this. We remember this event because it shapes everything that's happened and it gives us direction, it gives us a path for everything that comes in the future. That this event, God himself taking on flesh, giving his life to die for our sins, that we might be reconciled with God. And then God demonstrating his power over death. 
in raising Jesus from the dead. This is the event that changes everything. This is the event that changes the world. This is the event that changes our lives and make, makes it possible for us to break with our Israelite sisters and brothers of the far past whose hearts were hearts of stone. Jesus says, I have come to fulfill the promise that God made through Jeremiah that I will exchange your hearts of stone for hearts of flesh. Hearts that will be eager to respond to me and to live with me and to walk with me and to serve me and to seek me until all things are made new. This is what we celebrate this morning as we, as we come to the table and we, we tell a different and better story of what's happening in history. So I want to invite our servers to come forward and as they get into their positions, I'll invite everyone to come and to receive. Uh, just point of clarification, uh, in this new space, if you'd come to the front uh, through the middle and then go to the corners where uh, you'll receive the elements and then you'll go back to your seat down the sides, uh, there uh, we will all take the, the bodies and the uh, blood together.